departure. At least, I always find it bewildering. Um, in fact, it's one of those, you, you know, everybody has their favorite passages of Scripture, and, you know, it's very hard to say, there's a passage of Scripture that's not my favorite. This is the one that's not my favorite. Because it just, you know, John reiterates over and over again. And they said, you know, he's going to be taken away from us. And then again, they said this. And then, and I'm like, we could write with much more economy, couldn't we? However, I think that it's really important. Something very important is being said here with this restatement of Christ's departure. Some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. What does he mean by this? So when our Lord spoke to the disciples about his departure, certainly, he was preparing them for at least one thing, but for two, in fact. He was preparing them for his death and his resurrection. All right, that much we know, but he's also preparing them for his return to the Father. In the first case, they would not see him, and then they would see him again in a little while. But in the second case, he would depart, and they would not see him again. Not at all. Once he ascends up into heaven has taken, and is taken from them, they're not going to see him again. Once he's ascended to the Father, ne neither uh, we nor they would see him again until he returns to judge the earth. This is what we know. Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. But until then, we will not see him. So one of the things that this passage is about is presence. Jesus' presence with the disciples and his abiding presence with the church once he re uh, returns to the Father. Now, if you've been following the daily lectionary, which is the weekly readings um, for scripture for each day for morning prayer, and it's printed in the back of your bulletin, all right? So if you wanna, if you wanna keep reading through the scriptures during the, year, the, the uh, each week and during the year, all of the, all of the readings are printed out in the back of the bullet. Um, in case you don't know how to find them in the Book of Common Prayer, right? But if you've been following the daily lectionary, you might have noticed that presence could be the theme there as well. In the book of Exodus, we read how the presence of God leads the camp of the Israelites through the desert by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Could you imagine you imagine being the entire tribe of Israel, all of these people, 
being led by the pillar of cloud by day, God's presence manifests. And at night while you're camped, this blazing pillar of fire guiding you and attending you. But when Moses ascends up the holy mountain to receive the commandments and is delayed, the Israelites revert to a pagan orgiastic worship and make a golden calf. And then Aaron forges it for them. And after Moses rebukes them on God's behalf, afterwards Moses rebukes them on God's behalf. That's how that goes. At the same time, or following that, Moses would enter the tabernacle, often called the temple, the, the tent of meeting. And then when he would meet God there in the tent of meeting, the same kind of pillar of cloud would stand at the door and God would speak to Moses. And this is one of my favorite passages of scripture because it says, God would speak to Moses face to face as a man God would speak to you as if you and he were friends and it was familiar. In chapter 33, Moses replies to God. He says, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, listen to his prayer. Please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses knows they're not his people. They're God's people. And he prays and says, show me your ways that I may know you. And God answers him and says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses replies back, if your presence does not go with me, don't bring me up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct, I and your people? from every other people on the face of the earth. God's people are distinguished by God's presence. God answers Moses promising his continued presence. And Moses is adamant about it. If God's presence does not go with them, he will not move. Moses follows it up with yet another request. He says, show me your glory. And again, God responds directly and favorably to Moses. He says, I will make all my goodness, I love that, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I show mercy. Of all of the things that God could have made pass before Moses, what does he make pass before? All my goodness. All his goodness. God makes the pass before Moses. Not all of his, not all of his wrath, not all of his power, all his goodness. In this narrative, Moses understands that the distinctiveness and safety of God's people depends on the presence of God. How else would the surrounding nations know that they are a distinct people? It is in in fact, God's presence with them and all of the de deeds that God does on their behalf that marks them as God's own. <laughs> most interactions with God, uh, Moses' interactions with God, like many others that we find in Scripture, foreshadow the gospel. In Christ, God has made all his goodness pass before humanity. In Jesus, God's goodness passes before us. And as it was for Israel, when his manifest presence in the cloud eventually retreated from them, Christ's presence has retreated or is retreated to the heavens. He goes to the Father. But he forewarns and prepares them, saying, 
and talking to them not only of his departure, but assuring them of his continued presence. I will be with you. And Jesus says, but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. It doesn't feel like that to them at the moment, but they'll understand it lately. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. If I, but if I depart, I will send him to you. You will have my continued presence. Before long, Jesus would depart from the disciples to the one who sent him, but the divine presence would not retreat from the human race permanently. He pledges his presence would remain with his, with his people in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, it seems to me that the world and the church have something of a strained relationship with the presence of God, the same way Israel did. For all intents and purposes, and certainly in the eyes of the world, the presence of God is an ear. There is no cloud by day. There is no pillar of fire standing in front of our churches. Neither can they see Christ bodily walking around, healing the sick, and casting out demons. Oh, yeah. Perhaps there are some saints who do that, but somehow they don't count. They don't see Jesus, but they need to see Jesus. Too often what we see, and what the world sees, is a church that has abandoned God, just like the Israelites that resorted to pagan worship when Moses was out of sight for too long. Large portions of the church have turned uh, to the gods of this world, gods of gold and pleasure, pagan religion. When the world sees that kind of church, they see no distinction between it and themselves. Just as the presence of God left wayward Israel, I think we could say that he has left large portions of the church. Now, Moses knew it was the divine presence that made God's people distinct. That's what set them apart. And he would not venture on with Iowa. And though Israel would be reviled, it was their holiness and their godly laws and the divine presence that marked them out to the nations of the world as distinctly God's own people. They were supposed to be a kingdom of priests unto the nations of the world, demonstrating what it looks like when God tabernacles among his own people. It was God's presence in their society, in their relationships, and in their worship that marked them as God's own. God could be seen in their interactions and in the way they live. When things are in their proper order, a godly order, the presence of God tabernacles upon the earth and with mankind. And that's what's intended. In fact, when we were talking about Genesis 1 yesterday in the men's breakfast, one of the things that we discussed was how Genesis 1 really is a picture of God setting up a tabernacle upon the earth where his, where his presence would abide and remain with us. And Adam and Eve become the priests upon the earth. And God is meant to dwell with them and with us. And that was broken at the fall. God intends to tabernacle with us. Though the world rejects God's presence, he has sent the Holy Spirit to convict the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. And when that happens, the world hates it. Hates it. It's not a surprise. The world is rebuked in its wickedness when the presence of God is among his people. In this world, we should be as Moses was, crying out, unless your presence goes with us, we will not go. And like Moses, the Christian should seriously pray, show me your ways that I may know you. Notice how it says, show, show me your ways, not so that I could be a more moral person or a more righteous person or impress other people, but that I may know you. That's God's intention. So that the same way that God spoke to Moses face to face, and Moses knew God, and it says God and, and Moses says, and you know, 
know me by name. That's what God's intention is for you, that you know him and that he knows you by name, personally, individually, that there's a real living relationship that we have with Christ. That's what, what we mean when we say that over and over again, right? When people say, oh, you should have a real, real personal relationship with Christ. It's talking about this, that we would know him and that he would know us. Jesus may have returned to the Father, but the fact is he's not left us without the comfort and guidance of his presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes on to say, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Moses was determined that they would not continue their journey in the wilderness unless the presence of God would continue to be with them, saying, unless you go before us, we will not go. So likewise, the Holy Spirit is given as our guide in the wilderness of this world. And there's no reason why a believer should feel lost and left alone to navigate this life. Because you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you're meant to live in this intimate gift of, with God's presence. God has sent the Holy Spirit to guide us. It would be as if it is a pillar of cloud. We are those who follow the fire and the pillar of smoke. Not physically, of course, but spiritually through the indwelling Holy Ghost. And this abiding presence must be as real in the life of the believer as it was for Moses and the Israelites and for the nations around them. It was this abiding presence of God, God's manifest presence, that let all of the other nations know, oh, their God is not just resigned to live in a statue and in a temple. Their God is out of the temple. Their God is traveling with them. Their God is attending them in a pillar of fire and smoke and smiting their enemies. Their God is actually with them, fighting for them, fighting on their behalf. God was out of the temple because, guess what? All the earth. Not confined to a temple. So we are those who follow the spiritual pillar of smoke and fire through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the same way that pillar and fire guided the Israelites in the desert, the Holy Spirit is meant and given to us to guide us in this life now. If we would only say, Let me know you. Let me know you. Show me your ways. What does it mean when it says, show me your ways? It's not saying, show me your laws. He doesn't mean, show me your commandments. He's saying, God, show me how you interact with us. Show me, really, how you work in the world. Show me how you're working in my life. Show me your ways in my life. The Christian life is distinguished by the divine presence, not church attendance. Oftentimes, we think that we've distinguished the Christian life by whether or not we go to church. We could attend church and never have the divine presence with us and not know, really know God the way Moses knows God. But the whole point is that Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. It's pledged to us. The presence of God is pledged to us so that we know God the same way Moses knows God. And Moses stands in the tabernacle and God meets with him and speaks with him face to face. And they're having a conversation. That's what religion is. That's what this relationship with God is supposed to be. Now, after all of these years, I have to confess, I'm still what we call a charismatic Christian. And amen. I'm, amen. Thank you. <laughs> Glad I got an amen. All right. Now, how many people are familiar with that phrase? Okay. More than a few. All right. 
So the charismatic movement was an emphasis on the presence of the Holy Spirit in a personal way in people's lives. And it moved through the church. I mean, we could talk about perhaps it going back to Azusa's feet, but it goes all the way back to Pentecost. Right? But it was an emphasis of, on knowing Christ. Right? That I may know you and know your ways. And it was an emphasis on the abiding presence of God that the Spirit really does teach us how to live. I just don't believe that it's confined to a particular style of music. How could it be? God's presence was with Israel in the tabernacle. They didn't have a praise band. Right? Not, at least not the way we think of it. But it's God's presence among us that characterizes the church. That's what should characterize this church, Trinity. That's what should characterize your life as a believer. The abiding presence of God. Now, one of the beautiful things that God said here is, oh, one spot. He says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And Jesus says, oh, I'm going to be leaving you. I'm going to depart from you. And right now you have sorrow, but you will have joy. And that is the departing gift. Joy. This is another thing that should mark the Christian life. Two things mark the Christian life. Joy and the abiding presence of God. And they're connected. You really can't have one without the other. And it's a joy that no one can take. Because the joy is in the presence. And where God's presence is, there is fullness of joy. And this is the gift that we're all supposed to be walking in. It stands to reason. That we, that we know joy when we abide in God's presence and He abides in us. So this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have the same kind of prayer that Moses prays. And I pray that you pray this uh, often. Lord, unless your presence goes with me, I will not go. I will not do anything that you're not leading me to do. I'm submitting my life to you. And whether I turn to the right or to the left, just like the Israelites in the desert, whether we go this way or that way, I'm only going in the direction that you're telling me to go. Do I turn left? Do I turn right? Do I take this job? Do I take this job? Do I take this action? What do I do with this particular relationship? What do I do with these people? Pray. When, when I talk about praying all of the time, I don't mean merely just like, okay, God, bless Aunt, Aunt Mary. I'm, I, what I mean by that is, God, let me know you and show me what to do. And I will not go unless your presence goes with me. I'm not going to go forward. I'm not going to do this or that unless I'm clear that I know what it is you want me to do. That was Moses' prayer. That's how he stayed in the divine presence of God. And that's how the presence of God remained with him. And this is what God's calling us to, right? As the church, to seek his will and say, Lord, I am not going anywhere unless your 